a violent conqueror, a great warrior, a mighty emperor. Who was Ashoka the Great and did he start India's Illuminati? A secret society so old, it's been around for over 2,000 years called the Nine Unknown. Ashoka the Great was known as a violent emperor. His empire stretched from present-day Iran through almost the entire Indian subcontinent, which he ruled for over 37 years. He brought a new way of thinking to an entire nation through Buddhism. But how can he be considered both a holy man and a violent emperor? Ashoka was born in 304 BCE, and he was the third son of Bindusara, the second emperor of the Mauryan Empire at the time, and grandson to Chandragupta Maurya, who founded the Mauryan dynasty in 321 BCE. Now, there are speculations of Bindusara not really liking Ashoka because he had rough skin and he wasn't really in line for the throne. Ashoka's oldest brother, Susama, was next in line, and it's speculated that Susama was plotting their father against Ashoka. According to Ashokavadana, a Sanskrit language text detailing Ashoka's life, to test Ashoka, his father Bindusara sent him to quell a rebellion in present-day Punjab, Pakistan, when he was in his late teens, possibly early 20s. Now, Bindusara didn't really have high expectations from Ashoka, but he did provide his son with a cavalry, an infantry, chariots, elephants, which were military tanks at the time, but no weapons. Ashoka wasn't worried though. With his army, he marched on, feet pounding the ground, the elephants leaving footprints in the earth. They advanced. Ashoka was convinced that if he was fit to be king, weapons would appear before him, and legend says the weapons did appear from beneath his feet when he needed them most, supernaturally. And the minute Ashoka the Great acquired weapons, he took the rebellion down. To his father's surprise, at a very young age, Ashoka was successful. He emerged as a true warrior. He was a born leader. He knew exactly what part of his army to deploy at what time. He knew exactly how to maneuver his army. And above all, he was a great leader of men. And this shocked his father. He was set up to fail, but he didn't. After being proven wrong, Bindusara appointed Ashoka to govern Ujjain, an ancient city in central India. Now, there are texts that say that he was actually sent to govern Gandhara, which is the ancient region that covered the northwest part of present-day Pakistan and the southeast part of Afghanistan. Supposedly, on the way to Ujjain, he traveled through a city where he met a woman named Maharani Devi. She was a daughter of a merchant, and he completely fell in love with her. She was drawn to him, and according to ancient texts, Devi came from the same clan as Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, which is where Ashoka was introduced to Buddhism originally, and eventually Devi would become his wife. At this point, Ashoka wanted the throne. He knew he'd be a great emperor. So when his father, Binusara, fell ill, as stated in the Mahavamsa, which is a historical epic poem, Ashoka traveled back from Ujjain as fast as he could, and he took over the capital. Much of this was due to his father, Binusara's prime ministers. The group of men actually favored Ashoka over Susima, his brother. Ashoka had Susama killed by his appointed prime minister, Radha Gupta, who by his wit tricked Susama into falling into a charcoal pit. Ashoka then killed the rest of his brothers, so there was no competition. He was ruthless. After his father's death, Ashoka ascended the throne around 268 BCE. Before becoming a man of peace, he carried out cruelty. He would often test the loyalty of his prime ministers to see if they could really be trusted. One day, he approached the group of them and demanded that they cut down every fruit-bearing tree and every flower tree that the eye could see. And when they didn't do what he said, he beheaded a hundred of them to make a point. He ran the empire with a tight fist. During the eighth year of his rule, Ashoka fought the bloodiest and last war during his reign, the Great Kalinga War. It was the largest and deadliest battle in Indian history. Kalinga, which was in the eastern coastal region of India, had no appointed king. It ran peacefully without one. His grandfather, Chandragupta, tried to conquer Kalinga during his reign, but he failed. Ashoka wanted to do what his grandfather couldn't. Some scholars say that Kalinga was a threat to the Mauryas. Why? Kalinga controlled the coastline for trade by the Bay of Bengal, which is an area that Ashoka had not touched yet. 
So in 261 BCE, with his army, Ashoka marched towards Kalinga. The clashing of swords and the cries of many surrounded him. He was right alongside his men. The aftermath of the war caused 100,000 to die, and 150,000 were captured from Kalinga. It was a complete bloodbath, and when the dust settled, Ashoka stood before the carnage, filled with guilt and remorse. The whimpers of children torn from their mothers and the cries of men wounded and dying filled the air. Ashoka was surrounded by corpses, some still alive, and others left for the vultures. It was a gruesome scene that changed him. The people of Kalinga fought for their freedom, but Ashoka defeated them and now he was lost. He cried out in agony, but it was too late. When he finally returned to his palace, he was a hero in the eyes of his people, but a villain to the people of Kalinga, and that didn't sit well with him. He slowly converted to Buddhism after the war, which was monumental because he was the first king to ever do something like this. Instead of forcing his beliefs and degrading others, he respected other religions. He once said, Whoever praises his own religion due to excessive devotion and condemns others with the thought, let me glorify my own religion only harms his own religion. As his conversion to Buddhism progressed, he commissioned a series of edicts or decrees that were carved in stone, pillars, caves. There were 14 edicts in all that were written in Greek Aramaic, Brahmi, Goroshti during the 10th year of his reign. Each edict promoted the Buddhist Dharma that centered around peace and nonviolence. He sent Buddhist missionaries to Southeast Asia and as far as Greece to promote the Buddhist Dharma that he adopted. The edicts say, no living being is to be slaughtered or sacrificed. Medical care should be available for humans as well as animals throughout the empire. Monks are to tour the empire every five years teaching the principles of Dharma to the common people. One should always respect one's parents, priests, monks, prisoners, are to be treated humanely. H.G. Wells, an English writer, even wrote in his Outline of World History that among the tens and thousands of names of monarchs accumulated over time, Ashoka shines almost alone, like a star. There is an edict that captured only part of what Ashoka felt about the war in which he says, even one hundredth or one thousandth part of those that were slain or captured in Kalinga is considered regrettable by the beloved gods. He gave up war and violence and chose peace and pacifism. He became a holy man. And this is where the myth of the nine unknowns starts. Around the same time, Ashoka believed that evil could be defeated through knowledge. That knowledge can overpower the bad and it needed to be preserved only to be used when the world needed it. He forbid anyone from using their intelligence for evil, and thus the legend of Ashoka the Great founding a secret society called the Nine Unknown was born. It was further pushed by writers like Talbot Mundy, who wrote The Nine Unknown in 1923, which was half fiction, half scientific theory, and Lewis Powells and Jacques Bergier, who wrote Morning of the Magicians in 1960, detailing the legend of the Nine. The myth goes, several years after the Kalinga War, he called upon Radha Gupta, his trusted confidant, to assemble a group of nine men. These nine men were to be experts in nine disciplines, and once they were assembled, he instructed them with an ongoing task of preserving secret knowledge. Knowledge, if fallen under the wrong hands, could be dangerous to all of humanity. That it could destroy humanity if anyone wanted to use this knowledge for evil. The nine were instructed to write down everything they knew about the disciplines. They were responsible for guarding and revising one book, nine of them in total. The first book was on propaganda. It was filled with techniques on how to use propaganda and psychological warfare to manipulate people into doing what you wanted. It held secrets on how to mold any audience and govern the entire world, and some say this was one of the most important books. The second book was Physiology, and in the book was a written explanation of how to kill a person with one touch by reversing the nerve impulse, the touch of death. The third book, Microbiology or Biotechnology, held knowledge on how to use microbiomes to promote health and purification, the secrets to immortality. The fourth book, Alchemy, deals with transmutation of metals and how to create gold. The fifth book is about communication, and this differs from propaganda because this book outlines how to talk to terrestrials and extraterrestrials. 
the implication being that the existence of extraterrestrials was acknowledged among the nine. The sixth book is about gravity and how to manipulate it, and the seventh is cosmology, information about all the universes and the planets. The eighth book deals with light and information on the speed of light and how to weaponize it. And the last one, the ninth book, is sociology, detailing the evolution of how different societies have evolved and how to predict their downfall. It talks about how to create a society, but also destroy it. If any of the members of the Nine fell ill, retired, or were even killed, another would take their place. Louis Powell's and Jacques Bergier stated that the Nine have watched civilizations being born, destroyed, and reborn again over time in the shadows, always there to impede when necessary. Pope Sylvester II was said to have traveled to India, where he acquired skills that didn't make sense for him to acquire, and he was linked to the Nine along with Albert Einstein and Vikram Sarabhai, the scientist that created India's space program. Talbot Mundy, who published the book called The Nine Unknown Men, was part of the British force in India for 25 years, and his book is the main pillar supporting this theory. We have Ashoka's edicts that point towards his thirst for knowledge and preserving it, but do we have concrete evidence of a secret society that was founded 2,000 years ago, lurking in the shadows, ready to help when necessary? No. For now, this is just a myth. The main goal of a secret society is to remain a secret, right? Throughout his life, Ashoka the Great dedicated his time to building a society and nation that followed rules of morality. He no longer went on violent conquests, and this caused quite a stir. Questions started popping up. What if his pacifism led to a rebellion? Was he becoming weak? But Ashoka the Great was still a fierce man. He was still an emperor above all. So if anyone tried to invade or even rebel, they were put down instantly and at times, brutally. His empire thrived for as long as he reigned. Ashoka the Great died during his 37th year as emperor in 232 BCE. He was 72 years old. When he fell ill, he started making donations to the Buddhist community, or Sangha, using state funds. And when he was cut off from the state funds by his prime ministers, he started donating his personal things. The last thing he donated from his deathbed was half a piece of fruit. That's all he had. When his body was carried out to be cremated immediately, his body burned for seven days and seven nights. After his death, his empire barely lasted 50 years. There's not much we know for sure about Ashoka the Great, but what we do have are his edicts. A man who traded war for peace. And there may not be concrete evidence of the Nine Unknown, but what do you think? Could there be a secret society that has been harboring secret knowledge for over 2,000 years that was started by an emperor? We will never know for sure. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe so you don't miss any more. And I'll see you in the next one.